Eight and a half. Eight and a half. Okay, welcome to episode eight and a half. <laughs> the liminal. Uh, the liminal. Uh. Yes. <laughs> the interim, uh, interim podcast. Um, yeah. So we're back. This is uh, this is basically a free range riff on everything and every one that we've talked with so far. Uh, we don't know where this is going to go, but we just felt like it was time to do an integration episode uh, or a digestion episode, as it were. So let's let's just jump into it, guys. Um, who who has some emergent thoughts? I know Matt had written a few things this morning. Maybe you want to start us off. Yeah, I mean, I was just sort of uh, we talked about sort of reflecting on kind of where we started with this. I know at our work we kind of started when the whole coronavirus thing was affecting our business, and it was about nine weeks, and it was about the same time. <clears throat> that we started our podcast and we've kind of gone in a lot of different direction, having different guests on to kind of hopefully illuminate some ideas that we uh, were discussing at the start of this. And I think all of us said, Hey, it's a good time to sort of take a time out, reflect on, on the guests we've had and uh, just sort of see where do we go from here. And I know um, something that I've been thinking about sort of uh, asked you guys in the discord channel was, um, as my boss asked me, sort of, what's the end game of this podcast, and uh, what are we trying to accomplish? And uh, I know for me, uh, and I think uh, Andres really kind of said this too, and, and um, I'm definitely with him on, is there a cohesive or coherent narrative, and especially from a progressive point of view, I, I think one of the common things I'm hearing from a lot of the guests is there definitely appears to be like a splintering of the progressive party and not having really a uniformed idea in which a center in which all of us sort of can resonate around. So I think really, I would just kind of open it up to you guys to see what your thoughts are on that. Mm. Yeah. I don't know, Ryan, what, what do you think? You think it looks like you're thinking. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm always thinking, but uh, you know, the, the, I was telling Jeremy, before we started recording that Delman Coates is basically uh, my hero and uh, I can now retire from the podcast because he answered all of my questions and all of the original questions that we had posed on our first episode. Um, he's explicitly marrying the lower right quadrant, the economic, social, political change um, dimensions with spirituality and religion and left-hand quadrants and he's infused all of these economic ideas with a very soulful, spiritual, meaningful uh, framework with his, his Christian and black church uh, path of you know, liberation theology and uh, the, the fight for freedom, justice, and equality, as he was saying. And I think the way that he communicates this message to his community, his, his congregation, is just brilliant. I, th I thought the musical chairs analogy and actually having uh, people participate in that to get a first-hand experience about what it's like to live in a society that's not based on scarcity. I thought it was a brilliant idea of translating across value spheres, of taking a, a very complex and even boring subject like economics and making it relevant and interesting and engaging for people who are, you know, he was saying like, I got to help that guy on the street corner, right? Like, I'm not talking to other intellectuals. I'm talking to people who are really maybe even really struggling in life who are part of my community and we're going to look after you spiritually and materially. Beautiful, right? Like a beautiful example of walking the talk and instantiating these integral ideas into something very concrete to help people at the bottom. I mean, this guy is like everything I've ever wanted. And what I started noticing in my reflections of him and, and, and other guests, and I, I don't, I kind of hesitate in saying this because I don't want it to sound like a divisive comment, but I really have a tremendous amount of respect for him and what he's doing. Um, more so than almost anyone I've met so far or, or, or talked to so far in these communities because of how he embodies this and brings it to everyone, right? He brings this message. He, he penetrates through the insulated bubble that, that can be, become a problem in some of our emergency consciousness communities, right? And he's able to take these ideas and deliver it to the, to the masses, in, in his, and and I, I just just bring up the explicit part of, you know, he's black and he he lives in Baltimore, I think, right in Maryland, and um, he comes from this Martin Luther King tradition, and the, and there's just something about it that's so intrinsically soulful in it, and just the way he talks and his 
magnetism and charisma just exudes from him. You can feel it. And, and I just, it's so refreshing. You know, I, I spent the morning before we talked to him, listening to Daniel Schmachtenberger talk to Eric Weinstein on the portal, you know, three white or two uh, uh, white guys, super intelligent, talking about very abstract, complex systems theory kind of stuff for three and a half hours. And to go from that conversation talking to, to Dr. Coates was quite the, the lovely contrast, right? Some, and, and I just felt the, the groundedness and the soulfulness of his, uh, his message. So that's really what's been inspiring to me and what I've been uh, digesting over the past few days. And as, as he's just a perfect example of everything I was looking for, how do we bring the left together? How do we unite the left? And doing it using modern monetary theory as the unifying framework is so brilliant because it's something so concrete and tangible, right? It's not another cultural idea. It's, it's a beautiful example of how this is how we change the consciousness of society by changing the economic structures and systems and, and how he el elucidates and illuminates that interconnection and how that can be done. I was so impressed. So I'm gushing here and uh, that's kind of, all of my <laughs> compacted thoughts getting expressed for uh, this session. Hell yeah, Ryan. That's good. That's good. Um, I, I felt very similar after uh, talking to Dr. Coates, talking to Delman. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I know that in the, in the, in the left community, there's a, a discussion to put it lightly about MMT. There's agreements and disagreements, et cetera. But I think, what supersedes some of that theoretical or abstract disagreement is, well, here's an example of somebody who's actually building a community um, inspired by these ideas. They're on the ground and it's effective. So, I mean, it's hard to argue with that, right? Because what, what do we really want to do on the left, right? We want to capture the social imagination or the social imaginary around money. We want to change popular opinion just to based off of like, well, Maybe it can be more democratic, the workforce. Maybe economics can become more democratic. Um, as I was saying in our, in our private discussion, like any work that is helping to change public opinion about what can be done, right, that is countering the narrative, like uh, Dr. Coates was saying, and you hear this on every single interview um, about the Green New Deal or Medicare for All, it's how are we going to pay for it, right? And the austerity model that... Uh, that um, Dr. Coates was discussing is this sort of roadblock to the public imagination. So if the public is already kind of on board with like, wait, 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 no, there are other theories from people we respect or not, they're not quack theories. They're actually very robust economic theories and we like them. I don't think it's so much that like people need to get MMT. They just need to understand like Coates was saying the basic, um, uh, uh, possibilities, right, that are grounded, like, oh, actually, you know, we shouldn't have an austerity model for our economic system, like, oh, okay, like, there's not enough musical chairs for everybody, right? like, these very basic opinion changes just in, in public consciousness are what's really important, and regardless of whether or not we agree that MMT is the best cohesive, coherent theory that everybody should get on board with, I think it's, we should get behind it insofar as this as it is changing the public imagination. And I think it's great. I think it's great. I think what he's doing is really inspiring. And um, I would love to see like, as a kind of like a, like a emulative model, right? Like what Dr. Coates has done really could be possibly adapted by other communities, especially in the consciousness culture, right? Like I know Terry Patton has been kind of exploring what this could mean like a spiritual community that is also politically maybe socioeconomically more activist oriented more left oriented in his own way right um i don't know how successful that experiment has been but i know that like there is a desire for um the consciousness culture to start to find ways of, of implementing this on the ground and i think we should look to dr Coates, right we should look to um, the African American spiritual communities uh, to to learn something from them, you know, and build these coalitions together. So, anyway, I, I was very inspired as well. Obviously, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, one of the thoughts that I had following sort of both of the conversations with Andres and uh, Doctor Coates was, 
you know, for me going into this, a big question was that lower right element. Uh, admittedly, it's probably my uh, weakest area and not having answers to, well, how do you pay for this? Um, I know we started off with, at the po beginning of this podcast, sort of knee deep into the Biden-Bernie debate. And it's interesting that Bernie wouldn't capitalize more on this idea. Um, he had Kelton as his economic advisor, and I know I was asking the Discord group about if they recall you know, the MMT being brought up in the debates. I, I don't think anyone could really recall that. But I know it, you know, I'm not an economist, and um, but it definitely for me, if if this theory is correct and and, and kind of running with that, it changes the question for me from, you know, how are you going to pay to for it, to how can we don't already have this, and I think that's it really brings up the Machiavellian aspect of politics and how much people want to keep their power. And I know one of the questions in my head is really, how do you mobilize the public? You know, bringing these ideas was one of um, our, our sort of starting points as far as talking about some issues that I think can um, collectively have people come together over something. And I definitely think if MMT is accurate, it, it kind of shifts the conversation to, okay, we've answered how we're gonna pay for it. Now it moves to, well, how can we don't already have this? And kind of what is that, as Hanji calls a relative utopia even look like if, if this does kind of get off the ground and, and people get behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there's this kind of, um, it sets it into a broader context of what is the project of the new left? What is the project of the new left in the context of economic progressivism, which has been really surging in the, in the United States and around the planet. Um, and of course, like in the not only in the middle of the election cycle, right, has this been the debate? Like, but really, we started off because we wanted a space to have these kind of discussions, um, to be like, hey, we are economic progressives that are integralists, or you know, some kind of broad meta theory or some kind of broad evolution of consciousness theory that also align with leftist principles, whether we are anarchic, um, Taoist anarchists, like I, I kind of am, or, you know, we are, you know, just generally on the left and consume leftist media and participate in that conversation. Um, there really wasn't too much of that represented in the integral theory world or the game B world, or to some degree in the meta modern world, even though they're much better in terms of being much more politically active and involved in the political project. So we wanted to create this space. And then in the middle of this, the election's happening. And in the middle of this, a pandemic happens. And then the global crisis, economic crisis is happening. So what's interesting is like, we were kind of writing on a, um, the zeitgeist of the times just in terms of economic progressivism. But even in the middle of that, there's so much that has happened that is completely unpredictable in terms of, What's going to happen when quarantine is lifted in a few months? And I don't know if it'll be permanently lifted, but are there going to be mass protests? Are we going to see some kind of, um, you know, uh, activist movement on par with Occupy Wall Street or the Arab Spring? Like, what is going to be the response to uh, the bailout right now or the response to, you know, the left trying to implement like Andres was talking about the Green New Deal and all of these policies, you know, there's going to be a lot more urgency. And um, I think a lot more intensity on the left through this. Now, how that's going to manifest, I don't know. But I, I guess I don't really have a, an integration It's just sort of like, wow, let's process this because it keeps getting even more unpredictable than even a month or two before, right? So for me, it's like, I'm glad we're here to process it as it's happening and have these sort of discussions with these scholars and researchers and ourselves to at least kind of hold the space to have this kind of conversation. Right. So. Yeah. I mean, our, our timing couldn't have been better for, to start this podcast. I mean, I think, I think what you're saying, Jeremy really points to how complex and interconnected our modern world is where something like a virus that started from, People eating bats in Wuhan, China, had a cascading chain reaction effect through complex systems that scaled at orders of magnitude and caused ripple effects both in terms of economic consequences, political consequences, consciousness implications, right, that we could have never imagined. 
something like this emerging and having this much of a, a ripple effect across the system. And one of, one of the things that I've been thinking about too is I was watching those uh, videos of the, the people protesting the lockdown and the things that some of the people were saying. And there was this woman who was saying like, who, who's, who can tell me that uh, I can't go and, and get a haircut if I want to, or I can't go out in public and do what I want. And I think that, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a lot of reasons why someone wouldn't fully grok the importance of social distancing and, and exponentials and how fast something like a virus can spread and, and your role in that network. But it really, to me, it really had, a, I kind of had a Hanzi moment of like, you know, I'm really hesitant to start backing some of Hanzi's ideas, but complexity of development or MHC level, right? In the model of hierarchical complexity, like that stuff may be more important than I thought it was before in situations like this. Like if people don't have the complexity of consciousness to grok these kind of important things, they could lead to the downfall of civilization. <laughs> and I, I, again, I, it's something I really don't feel, really feel comfortable saying, but especially it, 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 with an implication of, oh, we need to, you know, evolve all these people, these lower consciousness people, we just got to get them to evolve. Like, you know, I'm not into playing that game, but I did have that, that thought became a little bit more, I, I started to, to entertain the possibility of if there is a way that we can have a, a some way, education, whatever, uh, of getting people to have a little bit better understanding of the ripple effect of your actions in a time like this, that might be nice. So uh, yeah, I, that's something I've just been uh, chewing on lately. Yeah, I mean, something that's come up uh, sort of when Jeremy was talking and also with you, Ryan, was I, I'm still, again, there's no preconceived ideas that we had going into this, but definitely I know something that kind of I was left with sort of following multiple podcasts, definitely with Steve McIntosh, Developmental Politics, and also recently with Dr. Coates was, you know, and Jeremy sort of talking about the new left is part of me feels this uh, unit, you know, unity force wanting to stick together with uh, what we identify as Democrats and get behind whatever because we're all anti-Trump and, and, and wanting to move that forward. And then there's also this idea that is it sort of reconcilable? I mean, these progressive and post-progressive point of views definitely also are also increasing in polarization. And so, you know, it's hard to know right now in this time of uncertainty where everything's going to go. Um, but I know definitely, you know, we were talking just about sort of having two different ideas and, and how do you navigate these sort of different energies that are coming up? Um, and I know Andres really had a good idea about, well, at least until the election, you know, you, you kind of want to get behind sort of getting Trump out of office, whatever you can do. But yeah, definitely you're seeing all these militias show up at like, you know, Michigan. And uh, there, I mean, even when we started, there was a lot of energy going on and it's just kind of just keeps going and going and going. I'm not sure if you guys have any thoughts about, um, you know, sort of a, a new party or what are you guys' thoughts on that? Oh, man, a new party. Um, well, I know Crystal Ball has been talking about it and a lot of leftists have been suggesting that it's just time to break with the Democratic Party for good. Um, I have doubts about it. And they're more of just um, uh, skepticisms based off of just knowing the being familiar with the political landscape, I've read some articles pro and against the idea, and I don't know. I don't know if, an, if, if a third party could really take hold um, at this moment. But at the same time, the other option isn't so good either, which is you just got to play with the institutional Democratic Party and infiltrate it as best you can, and over the course of decades, maybe move it away from the center. Um, that seems like a long game. I, I think um, folks like uh, Noma Key have been talking about that on the Noma Key show, just like, yeah, that is the game. That is the, probably the most viable option that we have because a third party, um, it's going to be blamed for pretty much every uh, democratic loss going forward. You know, I don't know if there'll be enough people on there either, but at the same time, we can't ignore the reality that the democratic party is 
kind of split generationally speaking there is a tremendous bifurcation and they're not getting along with the the centrist side of the line and vice versa that's just the reality so like do we do we like run with that reality and see what happens and uh, just try to figure out what the political fallout of that is by starting a new party or do we hold that tension somehow within the Democratic Party? I mean, what happens there too? I, I don't know. I honestly don't know what that should look like, but I have ambiguities about being all on board with a, with a third party at the moment, even though I've, I've voted for third parties before, right? Like in previous elections, because the argument has always been don't vote third party or you vote for, you effectively vote for Romney or you effectively vote for Bush, et cetera. So I know that's always been the argument, and I think the breaking point this election cycle was that we've gotten so close to actually winning, like Bernie got closer than anybody before, right? In terms of his policies and, and what he was representing on the left. Um, that was probably the biggest win by the progressive left in American, like modern history in terms of, you know, past 70 years or so, I think. So, you know, um, pros and cons here that's what no mckee says like hey guys like we're, we're kind of like getting too sore about this like we got so far and we really shouldn't be giving up this is actually a great sign yes it was a loss but it's 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 a sign that our momentum is taking um uh, making some kind of progress or making some kind of um valuable gain uh, in the democratic party so as you can tell i'm just oscillating between the two i don't know so so jeremy like you were mentioning one of the drawbacks of third party as it's getting started is that you play spoiler and end up in, you know, putting the, the more evil option into office in the, in the predominant two party duopoly. But what are, what are some other drawbacks of a third party or just more parties in general that you've researched? Right. So one thing I'm thinking about is if, if we take, for example, let's say that the th this third party that we want to start, whatever it will be comprised ideologically of, let's just say that it was in full effect. So like one third of the country was Democrat, one third was Republican, the other third was new party. Could that also have bad effects that we may not think about? We may, that we may, we may idealize it now, but then we're like, oh shit, that wasn't a good idea. One thought, I just, this has a visceral intuitive feeling I have that I do like about a third party is it instantly breaks the duality of the the binary and bifurcation of the um just, just how much our consciousness is kind of locked up in that two-party system and and the binaryization of everything else in life i think that if we were able to cut into that in the political realm that could have cascading effects in different dimensions to get us out of that zero and one black and white mentality and have a little bit more inject a little bit more nuance and um uh ambiguity and sophistication into the way we think about politics so that our identities are not spliced into one camp or another. Now the concern, the practical concern I have for having more parties, and this has been documented by political scientists elsewhere, is that sometimes that actually does an even worse job of putting the worst op option <laughs> into office, right? And Weimar Republic in Germany was an example of, of having to, you cut the pie too thin in too many different ways. And so you, Hitler, in a worst case scenario, someone like Hitler could become elected. But I think the, the other question I have about a third party is like, what would it ideologically be? It's, you know, nuts and bolts. And I, th I still chew on the idea that Kim Iverson floated about the, the left wing populists and right wing populists need to team up to overthrow the establishment elitists. And we could see, uh, and she was going off about like, uh, what was it? Bernie Sanders and Steve Bannon ticket. <laughs> Oh my gosh. You know, she was talking about like a uh, <laughs> Tulsi Gabbard, Ivanka Trump or something. Like some really wonky combinations. But I think as, as it's been demonstrated in some of the, oh, I cut out, sorry, cut out for a second. It's been demonstrated in some of the Nordic countries. There have been examples of parties running left wing on economics and right wing on social issues and in a more conservative slant. And, and there might be a market for that kind of thing too with the new right and the, you know, the new left and everything and, and, and the anti-establishment uh, voters. So I don't know. Yeah. It's just no, thoughts. No, that's good. Um, yeah. The, the, I like, um, I mean, it's kind of like what the Hill is doing with uh, Sagar and Crystal from the Hill, you know, like uh, 
I didn't even rec- realize that like, Segar was was a conservative for like the first couple of episodes. Um, so, you know, I think there might be something to that, maybe in the more palatable conservative. Um, there's a lot to be to be looked at in terms of like, yeah, we do share certain values with um, with labor, with work, with jobs, et cetera, and, and obviously economic progressive principles that might be shared across the left and the right. And there's really no representation for that overlap, uh, politically speaking. You really have to choose, as you're saying, the binary. Um, and I agree with you in, in, the, in the principle of it and the spirit of it, and also for the consciousness of, of having um, superseding the the either or choice that we have right because we have these two megalithic parties that don't really you know first of all they they serve their their corporate interests more than anything but then secondarily you know they represent a very diverse constituency that you know they're just too big to really respond to in a dynamic way where people feel heard right and more so on the left right more so on the left where well, I don't, I don't know about uh, statistics or anything, but it seems that like conservatives and, and Republicans vote together, right? And they're an older voting block and they do it all together and they, and they seem to have better participation and engagement than the left does. But overall, I think American politics, like I don't know what um, the stats were this year during the primaries uh, or what will be during the general, but I know American voting participation is just, just sadly, pathetically low, right? So people don't feel like getting involved in politics does much to change their lives, right? So maybe a, four, a third party or a fourth party um, having more options out there that are less megalithic and actually able to respond more and be more dynamically flexible and, and creative and innovative with their policies that they're putting forward, maybe that actually would get uh, voter participation up. Maybe that would help revivify American politics, get people involved again. I don't know. But that would be one positive possibility of, of introducing um, additional parties. But this is abstract, right? Like we know these guys are, they hold the domain here, right? Institutionally speaking. So how would like this, this is the secondary question is like, how would a third party, a tertiary party, or even a fourth party really make headway? in the political landscape of, of Washington, you know, how would they play with the Machiavellian politics that are needed to get to some position of power? I don't know. <laughs> just, a, just a few quick thoughts. Um, I do think that if you had more parties, I do think ranked choice voting would be a fairly safe way to prevent what I, what I said might happen with electing Hitler, yeah. <laughs> because it'd, be, it'd have to be filtered through a, a runoff process that I think would be, a, a more or less nice like fail like a safe you know guardrail against electing some crazy thing the one i watched a political show called designated survivor <laughs> i don't know if you guys heard about that but um the the main character who is the president he said it to re- run for re-election as an independent and what happened in the show was that his friend who was a um, supposed to be a moderate republican uh ran also and then there was a Democratic candidate. So th- there were three parties in effect. And the Republican guy, as a strategy, decided to run really, really far right because the center was taken up by the president and then the, they had a Democrat running on the left. And he really galvanized this like super alt-right, like racist, like kind of like eugenics-based uh, base on the show. I don't know if something like that would happen in real life, but I do have some concern of continuingly tribalizing even more camps with more parties. And we have to, and, and Ezra Klein articulates this so well in his book on polarization that it's really, everything has become about identity in, in politics. And now we have these mega political identities where people vote only on identity and not on policy substance or anything else. And so one of my kind of far out ideas and maybe a truly integral society is post party and citizens deliberate on, on various local and, and larger scale levels and come up with nuanced policy positions that reflect interests of different groups, you know, substantially, uh, reflect them well. And we just try to get away from identity siloization as much as possible and just go straight to the issues themselves. And that, that's kind of like in my ideal world, I have no idea what the mechanics of that would look like, but I think if that was possible, that would be awesome. 
yeah, that would be quite a thing. I, you know, um, I can't imagine that would be too difficult. I mean, like, can you imagine like, oh, yeah, I am a, a Democrat with uh, this policy and then I am kind of like a centrist or a leftist with this policy, a centrist with this policy, and then kind of conservative with this one, you know, and you'd just be able to be, if not a member of all three parties, right, um, at the same time, not being exclusive, then, you know, perhaps uh, citizens can't be members of parties, but just kind of have um, aggregate voting blocks like oh you kind of do these here's your cluster of votes and how they're associated with these with these political orientations and everyone kind of has more of a dynamic and fluid sense of how they vote which is a more like reflective of the reality right um so that would be cool i don't know i feel like that would be way more possible with um with a a kind of a, a digital democracy of sorts you know like something that maybe um, um, Eastern European country would be experimenting with like Estonia. Um, I'm just thinking of Estonia because of how they have moved most of their, um, uh, their voting system online and effectively, um, which seems like an oxymoron because we're having so many problems, but I just think it's because the U S is so big. And then also, um, you know, we're, we're not taking it seriously enough. You know, if like, I always hear a story about like an 11 year old who can hack, like the voting machines, you know, in 30 minutes or something along those lines. Estonia doesn't seem to be having those problems. So I kind of wonder, but yes, I would say like that, that is what I would like to see as well. I don't know how that would grow down into our political reality in the U S climate, but um, Matt, what, what are your thoughts on all this? Yeah. I mean, for me, it was just the idea rather than saying sort of, sort of an abstraction, you know, not saying right now for this election, go ahead. You know, for me, just sort of, I just started Googling some of this stuff and, Looks like uh, the Slate ran an article in 2006 where Lieberman got on the ballot with uh, uh, 7,500 signatures and formed a brand new political party called Connecticut for Lieberman. (laughs) So, I mean, just for fun, I mean, and really when you're talking, Ryan, what what I really get from this is that there are, I mean, call them tribes, call them whatever you want, but I mean, there's different worldviews out there. And, And I guess for me, I get really disheartened, and I think most Americans do with the political process that they feel like their voice isn't being heard. And and something too, you said, Jeremy, that popped up that I read yesterday. Um, Anna Barr, the press secretary for Bernie, um, replied to a tweet put out that 9.7 million Californians voted in March, and that's 1.2 million more than in 2016. So I'm, I'm not sure. I'm probably across the U.S. It, it, it varies. I know at the start there's definitely less uh, people showing up, but th- I thought that that stat was pretty interesting. Um, I guess for me the the fun in this is trying to think about if we did have our own party, kind of what would it be and how would it stand out from the rest? Um, and I and you know just with that idea in mind, because uh, I guess. When I want to be involved with the political process, I, I, I don't want, uh, and I was talking with you guys earlier about this, the sense of learned helplessness and the sense of well, there, what more can I do? And I think the system we have right now, whether it be the economic system we're in, um, you know, you, you get to vote every couple years. How much of that is actually moving mountains? And um, the, the main piece I want to come out of this is, is to, to know that if I am going to get involved with something, Um, I am altering the landscape a little bit. And I think sometimes people can get disheartened and think, well, there's no point to this, you know, it's just going to be the Biden candidate and whoever they throw out there. And I'm just not sure how to change the narrative to make it feel like, okay, young people are getting more involved. And, you know, maybe we do take this as a win. We got a little bit further than we did. Um, Yeah, those are my kind of thoughts on the subject. So yeah, maybe we can go do a go around. Um, Matt, I don't know if you want to share your thoughts on if there was a, if we started the integral party or meta modern party or whatever, like what would be your top uh, priorities and policy agenda and that kind of thing? Well, I think the main thing I got from this was having that economic answer, you know, well, how do we pay for this? You know, and I think Bernie's response is, well, you tax the billionaires and the millionaires And maybe that was just the wrong way of looking at it. You know, this MMT idea really kind of emphasizes we're thinking about money all, you know, wrong. And if the idea is the federal government can actually go into debt 
and provide some of these services without having to rely on taxes, it completely opens up the Green New Deal as something that's not, it's just totally possible. And it's just whether or not we have that political collective agreement to say, this is where we want the future to be. This is how, and we have to start now. And so my really leading question, well, and, and that was just, that would be my answer. So if, if my main thing would be to back MMT and, and the ideas behind that, because I think it opens up finally the, the rest of the field to go, okay, you can start investing in these new technologies, this federal job guarantee. Um, I mean, the sky's the limit. How about you guys? Yeah, how about you, Jeremy? So I don't, I don't know if I would do much different than, you know, what Bernie had put forward and what the Green New Deal put forward. I think um, some combination of taxing the uber rich and MMT could be an interesting hybridization just in terms of like satisfying like, okay, though the money's not coming from just being printed. Um, but at the same time, the money is coming from, you know, the uber rich and there's some kind of wealth cap in our country i think you know really a party that could address the 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 economic unsustainability right of of the uber rich and actually begin to put some limits on that capacity really to kind of change again the social imagination of like how much money should a person be able to have like can should there be a jeff bezos in the world like bloomberg was asked you know should you exist and the answer i think should be no so any kind of like legislative and economic policies that could begin to curb that com combined with MMT, you know, combined with some of the best ideas. And then also just like raising awareness that, you know, that like Andres was saying, you know, with MMT, I mean, it's not like they're using the theory. They're just, they're just performing that act every year with military budget spending, right? Like when we go to war, we don't just pull it out of the rich, uh, rich taxes and, and and public taxes, but it also comes from printing this money. So I think there needs to be much more awareness about like how we're already using this for for various things, mainly the the military spending, so um, defense spending. So yeah, I think it would be great some kind of green new deal infrastructural plan, hiring people, getting people jobs, um, because. Like one of the things that we talk about a little bit in this podcast, and I think we'll probably end up talking about more, is the larger looming climate crisis. Um, this is something we've discussed on the forum with like deep adaptation from Jim Bendel to Joe Brewer's work on uh, regenerative culture. So we're dealing with something that's that's um, just a, a, a planetary emergency, right? So if we can mobilize the country now, like. We, that's what we need to be doing. So the political project and the ecological crisis for me are just like completely integral to each other, right? So I would love to see if we were in my dream, dream United States, like an implementation of the Green New Deal, maybe even beyond what that that policy is. I haven't read it in, in full or anything um, to address the climate crisis and curb carbon emissions and switch our energy over to something far more sustainable. Um, but then I think, you know, the other element of this isn't just like the giant infrastructural turnaround that needs to happen. But I also think, you know, just like emphasizing education in terms of localized um, resiliency in terms of where we get our uh, supply chains from, where we get our food from, um, what kids learn up learn grow up learning to do like they should learn some basic farming and subsistence practices they should become familiar with their bioregion right in terms of food and resources um they should be practicing common centric you know communal gardens together in their neighborhoods whether they're in, they're in the urban environment or suburban and maybe yeah the federal government should be you know subsidizing some of these educational projects across the nation right and and giving some kind of incentive for people to be doing that to assist them, right? Tax breaks, uh, loan, uh, grants, et cetera. So I can see all that. And I know that is completely idealistic and utopian, but um, at the same time, I do think we're in weird times where the utopian gets flipped into the deeply practical, right? It's the whole growing down thing. Like all these ideas of mutual aid in the economic crisis right now are not because we're becoming 
idealists is because like they're making more sense as the old institutions are beginning to collapse. So how do we transition in a, in a, in a time of civilizational collapse? Cause that, that's what I feel like we're going through. Yeah. Well, well said. Um, how about you, Ryan? So if I was running for president, what would be the top of my agenda is some kind of democratic reform, uh, kind of like what I was just talking about. And I said this before on the podcast, but I think I, I haven't seen a lot of literature out there on how much our current system of representative democracy and our political institutions hamstring our consciousness evolution and keep us trapped in basically a deficient version of the mental rational consciousness and the party system and, and everything else that goes with it, I think has implications, you know, vote, Jeremy, you mentioned voter turnout and just citizen engagement and participation levels, uh, social ecological consciousness and awareness. These are all things that I think are very much hampered or damaged by capitalism and all of its pathologies of, commodification and not having a triple bottom line and putting profits before everything else, bad incentive structures, principal agent problems, multimodal traps, et cetera, but multipolar traps. But the real problem I think of democracy and the, I, how much our current system crystallizes our identity in a way that makes it impossible to, to take any other perspective into consideration, right? There's a word for it called a tribal epistemology. <laughs> Um, it goes along with things like motivated reasoning and identity protective cognition, where we're reasoning uh, like lawyers instead of philosophers, right? We're just trying to justify our identity in policy and in social issues. And so if there is a way to just break that whole thing up and have a way more nuanced process that involves, that integrates on some level, deliberative democracy with direct democracy that was secured by some kind of scalable blockchain or technology like Holochain or Tangle or whatever, and also have uh, it very beautifully scaled through a kind of holarchic or panarchic system where each uh, increasing concentric ring of society is harmoniously interacting with each level, right? So it's kind of like how, um, I don't know exactly what that will look like in, in practical principle, but it'll definitely involve transparency at a level we haven't seen before, uh, like some of David Steele's work on a, an open, the open source manifesto in, in, in a panarchy where each sphere of society is transparently communicating with each other in a very kind of Nicholas Luhmann-esque systems theory. It, it's a very kind of um, Nora Bateson way of thinking about systems. And and having a, a system of voting that where citizens feel some sense of responsibility and the, and some of the research done by like um, Amy Gutman and James Fishkin and, and researchers in deliberative democracy have studied how when citizens feel like their decisions and deliberations on policy issues actually make an impact, right? You actually have a direct say in how this policy is going to be implemented. People are more responsible. People are more willing to consider other perspectives, right? They're more interested in looking at the other side's concerns and representing all of the stakeholders in the process because you have skin in the game and are now responsible. If you fuck this up, you're gonna mess this up for everyone in your community. So I do think that having a different system like that could really drive consciousness evolution in a way that we're currently underestimating. And I'd love to see more explicit literature elucidating that, this, this idea. Good stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's well said. Well said, indeed. Yeah. Well, where do we go from here? That's kind of the big question. Um, yeah. Well, we want to have more guests on the show, specifically here being this podcast. Um, and I think it's been kind of fun. I, I, maybe we can pivot a little bit to um, the community-oriented dimension here because we started this as kind of like an on off the cuff let's just like give it a name and give it a logo like we spend an afternoon just throwing it together and um it's been really heartening to see engagement from the integral left forum on facebook and the integral community people are kind of like finding us like uh they're like applying to get approved in the facebook group and they're like oh i heard about you guys from your podcast and so it's, it's it seems to be um, 
traveling in the ethers into the integral community, which has been fun. So if you're listening to this and you're part of that, that's really cool. I'm glad we found you. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that's been really great. And I think we've really been fortunate to, uh, speak with the folks that we have like, um, Brent and, and Steve McIntosh and Brent Cooper. Um, uh, and then of course, Andres and, and Delman just most recently. So yeah, we want to keep having guests and I think we want to keep doing these integration episodes to kind of, um, synthesize and digest everything that we're kind of listening to and hearing and, and just seeing if there are any patterns that connect between different individuals and different domains that we're, um, conversing with. So in terms of what's next, you know, I, again, I feel like we're kind of, this is a very process oriented show that, that there's so many things that could develop between now and next week that we may have to adjust our plans again, you know, and, and come back and talk about it. Like, um, you know, again, like with, with Bernie's campaign, uh, I think we were all surprised that he was doing so well. And then when, with, with the, the corporate <laughs> Democrat takeover, before Super Tuesday, I think we were also surprised how quickly things changed again. So the dynamics of the, of the present are just so fluidic. Um, it's, it's hard to know where we're going next, but I think this practice of bringing on different individuals from different areas of the left and different theorists and processing what is happening might, might be just a good praxis, you know, just going forward for us. Um, what do you guys think? Well, I'm, I'm curious uh, to, to ask both of you this question. Um, I think, I think for me, one of the themes that I think, well, well, I'll just back up and say, what I think, what what can we offer that's unique, right? There, there's a million podcasters out there. There's a billion political shows and commentaries. What can we offer that's really unique from an integral, progressive perspective? I think one of the motifs that's come up multiple times with our guests is about marrying the spiritual, the soulful, right, the left-hand quadrants with social engagement and transformation and pol politics. And I, I think that I, I really resonate with some of Brent's frustration with the lack of political engagement from a lot of these emergentia communities. And I, I think that being able to consciously integrate the two are, is so important. And I was talking to um, one of my buddies who is a big fan of Jordan Peterson. And for him, the most important thing is how, how can he can, he can, he can become empowered and responsible in his own life um, to basically get his shit together and not self-destruct. Right. Like, like his, his um, sphere of reality is relatively small. And then that, that's, fine, right? That's where he needs to be. And he needs to really make sure that his room is clean and that he can take care of his own world. And I would love to see the left being able to incorporate that narrative and say, and in a kind of conveyor belt-esque way where, hey, we need to valorize the personal responsibility part. We could probably find a better word than personal responsibility. I mean, it's even that's even might be a little bit dated in terms of the ontology that it's pointing to, but I think that if, if we can find a way to coherently integrate these narratives, you can be a, a lost kid, some incel alt writer, and then be able to get into some of the ideas and then eventually scale up naturally. And as you get things together, you can eventually get more concerned about climate change and larger social issues. And I feel like the left currently goes straight towards or at least in these conscious communities, we kind of start at like becoming the planetary, right? And I'd like, to, I love, I'd love to see a, the full spectrum of cleaning your room to becoming the planetary, and and how we can make that uh, scalable to a mass audience. It's it's a tall order. I have no idea how that would be possible, but that's kind of my my vision. Yeah, I mean, something I thought about too, Ryan, when you were talking is, and and again, I know I've said this in Discord. But even the labels, the left and progressive, still don't sit right for me. And I, I really got, I mean, what, what I really liked about Macintosh's work 
and um, the idea of different levels is understanding a rather just sort of this horizontal spectrum. There is a, a vertical layer of development here. And I think, kind of, Jeremy, we were sort of talking about there in the, in, in the Gepser channel, but to th you, can't, you can't throw that out. And, and to me, it's like, if you have knowledge of this, how do you navigate those different levels? How do you speak to the traditionalists? How do you speak to the modernists? How do you speak to the postmodernists? And somewhere there, you know, for me going into this, it's really about what is the baby of all those groups? And how, how do you convince everyone that we're not fighting each other? If we're really the United States of America, if we're all Americans, then that trumps the, the D and the R next to your name. And to me, I really like, to me, I, I just think we're, we're, again, use maybe a Gebser term of the, the mental realm of, of splitting it up. But how, how do we actually kind of get this the biggest picture of this is where we are on the map and, and how do we all kind of move forward together? Well said. Um, I'm going to kind of add the, the Gipsarian take on, on where to go next uh, with this. And um, I think part of what I would like to continue to do is to facilitate those sort of conversations. Like we, we kind of have to be mediators naturally by being here. Um, not only between these different communities, but also within our own. Like we're, we're really trying to go like, okay, what, what kind of vision of the left or uh, a transformational culture um, would be, would reach the most human beings and not in terms of quantitative, but just like qualitatively, like what is oriented towards humanity, right? And then also phenomenologically, there already is a transformation of culture happening. Like ontologically, these shifts are occurring and metaphysics and philosophy and phenomenology and um, uh, weird ecology from like Tim Morton and all these folks are talking about this, integral, integral and metamodernists, um, Zach Stein. So like the change is sort of implicitly happening. Can we, can we articulate it in a way that is coherent enough to not only theoretically get what's going on, but also maybe beyond the theory to sort of um, instantiate or, or have the capacity to help others kind of feel like they're part of this too, whether or not they are like Peterson supporters or not, right? Like, I think some of this is prefigurative. Like I identify as a leftist and I identify as an economic progressive, but I know like, you know, even reading Gepter, the idea of like being on the left or be, or, uh, the, the notion of progress itself are, are really kind of things that he's suggesting that we supersede. Even understanding that, I can still identify qualities in the left and qualities in our current cultural transformation and political landscape that are that are expressing that integral ontology, even though they are identifying with terminology and even modes of thinking that might be outdated, right? So I'm kind of like, how do we hold the space for both um, kind of like being in the world, but not of it in that sense. Like we're, we're in the perspective of a world, but not of it, right? So how do we help everyone, including ourselves, realize the emergent ape perspective of a world that's sort of underneath our feet, right? It's like, it's the atmosphere we're breathing. Um, and what does that implicate politically, right? Like, what does that change mean? And Ryan brought up um, uh, the Peterson friend example. Uh, and I think this is something that like Michael Brooks has been talking about on his show and in his new book, uh, Against the Web, which I just finished reading. Um, but there's a great chapter on Peterson. And one of the things that I think I've really only heard Brooks say, like amongst leftists, is that there's motiv there's certain motivations for, for folks who feel drawn to Jordan Peterson, right? Like, what are the subjective motivations that 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 bring people to read Peterson and identify with him and watch his like Bible study lectures or whatever, you know, in depth psychology lectures. Um, you know, there, there's a desire for meaning making, right? So this connects to our larger project of, okay, we're using forms of sense making and structures of consciousness that have been deeply alienating from spiritual and meaning making questions, you know, and the left is the first to say, like, you know, Marx, one of the first to say, like, hey, we're, we're alienated from not only our labor, but from our humanity by being seen as, you know, um, as only laborers, as only, you know, time is money, um, 
there needs to be other forms of time. There needs to be other human capacities in a society that can, can promote that, right? The non-quantifiable, the qualitative, the subjective, the soul, right? So like, how do we make room for that? Because if we, if the left doesn't integrate that, if, um, transformational policies and, and cultures don't integrate that, then they run the risk of allowing it to manifest in, in a very violent kind of, um, retrogressive kind of way, you know, just in terms of the Steve Bannons of the world, um, you know, so, or the Petersons too, right? Like Peterson is speaking to a need in our culture. How do we address that need um, in the context of the left or in this sort of transpartisan vision of economic progressivism, which isn't left or right, but it's just like, okay, it's the way culture is evolving. So how do we bring all that together? You know, I feel like that's sort of the vision of, of this, this for me, because I ask these questions in my own podcast, but like here in, in our conversations, it's in the context of politics, right? It's in the context of the political landscape. So anyway, I'm just, I'm just rambling now, but I feel like that's, that's the feeling I get from that question. You know, I just want to point out something kind of funny. I don't know if this is a fair way of looking at it, but I kind of see Matt as the expert in helping these kids. <laughs> cause, cause I, isn't that what you do, Matt? Like working with like, are they like juvenile delinquent? Well, what is the term? Yeah, just uh, antisocial youth. Sure. And, and you're teaching them a lot of great basic things, like, you know, basic kind of ethical standards and pro-social behavior and, and kind of helping to get that, that red impulsivity a little bit more refined, maybe a little bit healthy, blue or amber structure, right? Yeah. And then we have, we have Jeremy here who's uh, having his classes on diaphaneity and becoming the planetarian, Gebser, and, and uh, you know, time freedom <laughs> so it's kind of like we kind of represent the whole spectrum here and and my my crowd in mediation is probably more towards like matt's uh you know people people who are really struggling with like alcohol and and drug addiction problems and who are really fighting to stay functional um so we kind of we kind of fulfill the three of us fill the whole spectrum but i i think the left has done a lot of framing and a lot of economic policies propounded by the left are really aimed at helping people at the bottom on the material level, right? But I don't think that the left has been very good at providing a narrative or frame for helping people at the bottom on a more moral or spiritual or psychological level. And as long as this vacancy exists, it will be filled by the, you know, you're saying Jeremy, like Steve Bannon's or people like Peterson, who I have a tremendous amount of appreciation for. I've seen how much he's helped my friends with their own personal growth and growing up and cleaning their room. But I think we can give a healthier alternative that doesn't lead to reactionary anti SJW identity making uh, kind of thinking. And you can have the ceiling a little higher, so to speak, and more clearly outlined. But I think if that's why I was so interested and I'm a little remiss that we didn't talk to Dr. Coates more about his spiritual messaging and how if you're, if you're going to meet someone like, like what, what about someone who's like in prison, who, who has a, it's very spiritually beneficial to become a Christian and convert to Christianity, right? That, that, that can really help someone. Um, and then from there, right. How are you, how are you going to scale up to thinking about MMT and the, the progressive cause and then all these things. So I think, I think the left needs to, to really hone in on that. And, and uh, until we do that vacuum will be filled by some pretty pernicious ideas. Well, I know, uh, just kind of reflecting on what you said, Ryan, that I know Wilbur sort of talked about, I, I, I recall, uh, I'm going to forget the context here, but talked about the left sort of seeing why they're suffering in the world and it has to do more of a system orientation because part of their system, you know, led them to commit acts that were immoral. And the right's kind of more point of view is that, well, individually, these people are responsible for themselves and it, uh, they need, they are responsible for their own actions. And for me, the uniting force of that is, as an integralist, is you can have both. And so to me, it's really about um, trying to come up, and that's where we started this, the narrative, the vision that somehow can connect the left and the right, and somehow this be a whole body um, apparatus or thing or system or organism, right, about how we can not isolate ourselves and split ourselves up. I mean, right. Um, and I guess this, 
you know, we're kind of talking about how do you do that? And some of these definitions can become prisons in themselves. I mean, how many people can't even listen to maybe a podcast because we're identified as progressive and left? Um, I, I think it's helpful because that's kind of where we're leaning. But it, it's, I know moving forward, I'm always interested in the idea of how do you still connect with the other half of the country or the other half of yourself and, and still be a process where we are attempting to, in my eyes at least, come up with ways in which we're trying to ease the suffering of others. Yeah, that's well said. You know, I think um, one of the things I've, uh, some of the rhetoric I've appreciated from the progressive left uh, during the Bernie campaign, and I don't know if it was effective or if it reached the right people, but I appreciated the the candor and transparency of it. And it is, you know, we're focusing on everybody, even people who are voting against us. We we want them to have basic health care and basic support, you know, basic um, societal support, right? Like we just want to, them to be taken care of. Like even if we disagree with everything else, we still would want uh, a Trumper to a MAGA guy to be able to not go bankrupt, you know, facing some kind of health crisis, like just like that kind of mutual concern for everybody because they're human beings. Right. And that we should live in a society that um, supports basic needs, right. Has some, some level of decency and care for other people. And I think the more we can emphasize that on the left, the more, well, I hope anyway, the, the less the left would be seen or even identify itself as so polarizing. You know, I, I really feel like we need to emphasize that. And it's one of the things, one of the reasons why I'm, I, I very much, um, I'm appreciating what Michael Burks has been talking about lately in terms of how do we go forward after this election cycle. And it's, we need to support labor, we need to support unions, we need to support the kind of policies that would take care of everybody. Uh, but particularly labor, though, because labor is also this kind of working class orientation, right? No matter who you are, the people who are essential workers, right, who are in the factories, who are delivering our food, etc. We want to support them, we want to make sure they're taken care of and identified and valued as, as essential workers in our society. So how do we do that, you know? Um, and maybe that kind of left won't be seen as so polarizing because at the moment, since we've so undervalued economic progressivism, we've hypervalued identitarian issues, right? So like we've kind of went in the opposite direction, which I think has been the downfall of, of substantive policy changes in our country over the past, 30, 40 years. Um, so yeah, that, that's just my point. Like, how do we really bring forward this economic progressive um, value and vision in the social imagination? And, and I think that might be part of what helps us overcome the identitarianism. Yeah, well said. Uh, I, I should probably uh, save this question for Michael Brooks when we talk to him or maybe read his book. But the way that I look at any kind of social change prescription is what is the function of the existing system or thing we want to change? And does the new proposal fulfill that function in a way that's better? And if it doesn't do it in a way that's better or do it at all, then I think it's kind of missing out and won't be as effective. So when we look at the demand that's out there, the hunger that's out there for a Peterson like figure or a Trump like figure, or not, not that I'm morally equating the two, but just, people globbing onto ideas that we, would, we wouldn't deem as the most productive or helpful, right? Like, what can the left propose as a counter narrative that can fulfill a similar function, but not lead to disastrous outcomes, right? Like, like if you think about all the, the, your stereotypical Peterson young men kind of guys who need a father figure, they need discipline, they need structure, they need something to push them to grow. How can the left provide that narrative while also being pro- universal health care and welfare and all that kind of other stuff, right? And does, does Michael Brooks ever talk about what the alternative would be that could steal some of the uh, followers of those guys? Yeah, well, I think you know who we, well, who we would mention here, right? Jordan, uh, Jordan Peterson's alternative arch nemesis, uh, James Hillman, where, you know, Brooks always brings up Hillman as, as this, um, you know, he's a depth psychologist as well. He was a student of Jung's. He, run, he ran the, the Zurich Institute 
um, uh, the Jungian Institute. So, you know, he's very steeped in that world and in that tradition. But, and I wouldn't, I don't know if he actually identified himself as a leftist, but he was deeply aware that, uh, Brooks always mentions that this one book, we've had a hundred years of psychotherapy and the world's still getting worse. So it's this understanding that sometimes personal issues are exacerbated or even created by systemic social ones, right? That there can be, uh, the sickness in the soul can be a social one as well as just a personal one. And he connects the two. And I, I really think that's important because, you know, with, with Peterson, there's such an emphasis on like, clean your own room before you worry about everything else. But Hillman is actually addressing this from a depth psychology perspective, a meaning making perspective going like, no, no, the two start with the two being connected. Yes, work on yourself, but also recognize part of where your own issues and challenges come from might be from a very sick society, right? One that has an impoverished sense of soul making to begin with. So um, that's just sort of like the example he always drops. And I feel like that Hillman is a great, like, go read Hillman, please go read Hillman. But, you know, Hillman is a bit of a radical guy too. So I can understand why, you know, emphasizing Jung with Peterson could be still very appealing. But I, I, I welcome any other examples. You know, I think the left really needs um, uh, an abundance of, of, of thinkers and writers and inspirational philosophers who who are talking about meaning making but not shying away from uh larger social projects so and they do exist they do exist but we just need to highlight them more yeah i like that jeremy i know we have raised the question a couple of times about the soul of america and you talking uh, mentioning the sickness of the soul i think is is very uh, illustrating to where I was going with this is thinking, okay, well, if, if you are thinking about cleaning your own room, and especially from a union perspective, you're kind of looking for the shadow, the area in which you're not putting light into. And one of the things that I thought about when you mentioned that was, I know a common enemy, it seems, of people that I talk to just at the water cooler, so to speak, a lot of people are anti-government, and maybe even anti-federal government. And it's an interesting sort of way of looking at where the source of the problem is. Because I know for me, it's not that government, yes, government can do some things that you can look at and go shake your head. But for me, I think if we're accurately trying to identify the source of the problem, at least for me, it's more has to do with the, the share of the corporation in today's society. And I, and I know when you go deep into that and explore that with you know, things like Citizens United, and really some of these solutions we're proposing, to me, it's a lot of it has to do with that wealth inequality and how a lot of the money is going to that, as Dr. Coates would probably say, that lending part of the economy. And they're getting richer while others are getting poorer. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the the part of like, again, part of this, like we take Hillman's answer, which is look to the society as well for our, our collective illnesses. Well, you know, having a highly extractive, predatory, you know, pro-corporate uh, economic hegemony, basically, right, where corporations are essentially institutionalized and, and wedded to policy makers, just through corporate lobbyists, etc., you know, you're, you're dealing with a society that is, is in no way egalitarian, right? Like we have been increasingly dealing with this over the few past few decades. I think it's part of why we've run to folks like Trump and Peterson um, and Trump, especially, you know, just in terms of a fake economic progressivism, what he's been promising about draining the swamp and all of that. So, you know, I think, I think this is a big part of it. And again, this is why like, ultimately it, you know, in the consciousness culture, nobody really wants to say it's really about economics. They want to go, no, no, it's about consciousness. It's about like, you know, the, the mode of being that like, let's just like drop this old world and start like game B and like, like, okay, I understand that. But there's a danger again in bypassing like what you're talking about, Matt, right? Like, okay, yeah. Um, predatory economic banking and corporate policies do spiritually affect the the health and wellness not only literally biologically but spiritually socially psychologically of, of human beings in that society right so 
we could pretend to bypass it, but it's going to continue to have an effect on us unless we transform it, right? It's like if you have a piece of radioactive stone underneath your bed, like you can clean your room all you want, but like this thing, you're existing in something that is getting under your skin, you know? It's, so I, I, it's a weird metaphor, but like I just think about economics as this kind of like, this weird emission of a particular mode of consciousness is affecting everybody. Right. And it's very physical. It's very material. It's, it's very grounded in, in substantive policies and money flow and the way society runs. But um, we have to marry the kind of consciousness culture oriented vision with like, you know, you embody that consciousness in a material system. So you do have to change the material system. It has to be that kind of feedback loop. Um, Anyway, I'm rambling, but that's sort of the connections I'm making there. You're sounding a lot like me, Jeremy. Uh, <laughs> no, well, well said. But I just wanted to go back to, to Matt's point about the anti-government mentality. And I think that that's a very uniquely American thing. Like, of course, there are conservatives and libertarian thinkers all over the world. But the spirit and the form through which that anti-government thinking and, and action takes place is infused with this very kind of like a revolutionary, I don't even know how to describe it. There's this, <clears throat> government really can kind of, for a lot of people, impinge on what they think are their values of freedom, of liberty, right? And so it's infused with such a moralistic dislike, as well as uh, I think that can kind of drive the more practical nuts and bolts critique of bureaucracy and mandates and, and so forth, clunky government institutions. Um, and And... I'm just coming at this from a, like a Japanese perspective and the way that the East Asian tiger economies that followed in Japan's footsteps, right? Korea, Taiwan, was it Singapore, I think, Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong is a bit of an exception because they're more libertarian leaning, but a lot of these countries built their economies on a very, very strong government led, some people call like the, um, it was like state in state-led investing into private industry and corporations. And this is how like Korean, a lot of Korean industries became international powerhouses is because the government played a huge role. So the attitude towards government is, has a different flavor, right? In, in other countries because of different histories and different historical trends and cultural uh, ideas that, that coalesced around critiques of government. And I think that what can be, when it comes to thinking about how to win over the libertarians and the people, you know, the, the pro gun NRA crowd, get the, get the feds away from my guns, right? Don't touch my AR-15 kind of thing. I, I do think a lot of the integral ideas can have a resonance with that in terms of moving towards a more decentralized, localized, bioregionally independent um, panarchy or you know Taoist anarchism as you're saying jeremy right i i think it just comes down to really framing the ideas but if we i think matt that's a really good thing to consider how how important it is uh, or how, how much of an impact that people's dislike of the government has in their political choice making and sense making and i think if the left can integrate some of that into the narrative, it could hit a wider range of appeals. We're not trying to slash welfare programs or anything. And that's what Delman Coates was doing when I watched some of his videos when he was running for lieutenant governor. <laughs> and he was, he was combining robust public investment and social programs with tax reduction. Because with modern monetary theory, the government can take care of that and you don't have to tax from the private sector to fund public programs. So we can think of creative ways to appeal to those moral sentiments and I think a lot of in emerging ideas like the P2P common stuff is very constant with that. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice, nicely said, uh, Ryan. Um, you know, I was just thinking as you're talking about that, we, we talk about remixing a lot on, on our channel. So I think remixing American anti-government spirit, right, and mythology and history, just because there's a tradition of that kind of distrust of the federal government, leave me alone, you know, kind of libertarian spirit of the United States. Maybe there's a way to remix that and, and kind of refashion it into, you know, more in the spirit of mutual aid and Murray Bookchin's municipalism that uh, Matt Segal brought up in uh, during a P mutations podcast. So like, yeah, I think, I think, you know, what we, what we can do in it as part of maybe the project of what's next, um, 
generatively speaking, emergently speaking, um, is trying to find ways to remix some of these ideas, right? Or find people who are remixing these ideas. Um, because I, I do think that folks who are anti-government might be more trusting of um, not a big tent government, but like a more localized regional sense of economy and spirit, right? Like, even if you're living out, I bring this up with my wife sometimes because she was friends with libertarians in college. And so she's familiar with their arguments and we kind of go like a back and forth postulating different views. And she's, and I'm like, well, and she brings this up too. Like, you know, if you are a libertarian and you want to kind of live out in the mountain on your own and do whatever the hell you want, you know, you probably will be bartering and trading for certain goods and services and foods and et cetera. And you'll probably benefit from some kind of access to healthcare when you need it, you know? So there's, there's a vision here that, you know, again, in this sort of a perspectival turn, the yes, I am all for substantive federal policy changes and printing money like MMT talks about and Green New Deal and Medicare for All. I'm for those things. And I know those require a big tent government to, to handle or process. But ultimately, I think we are moving out of that kind of homogenous nation state. You know, I think the nation state is, is a perspectival fossil. You know, I, I do think the future is much more decentralized and we don't really have the socioeconomic, legal, policy, even social imaginary to really know what that looks like. But I do think we're being kind of nudged in that direction. So yeah, maybe it's both like kind of Americans, uh, America's past, and then also a really weird cryptocurrency, Murray Bookchin futurism, Taoist anarchic futurism. I don't know, but I kind of would dig that actually, you know. <laughs> There's one... Yeah, well said. Just one quick thought uh, before I forget here, but um, I think you know I've read a lot of libertarian books, and and I work for the government, so I kind of saw like the the dysfunctions, and of course, you know the the corporate private sector has a ton of dysfunctions too. Uh, but I can understand a lot of those arguments just because I've studied them very explicitly. It was kind of one of my uh, in the name of integral, I'm going to hold my nose and force myself to read these books kind of thing, and I'm glad I'm glad I did it. And what I really sense from a lot of these libertarian business guys who are pro deregulation and, and you know, small business, kind of like kind of like a very Mitt Romney 2012 campaign kind of kind of framing, is that they're really vanguards of the private sector, right? It, it's a we want to protect the private from government intrusion and encroachment and overreach. And I think that we need as we move into the integral age, we're going to see a dissolution of the hard bifurcation between public and private. And I think we meet in the middle through the collaborative commons and civil society and civ civic participation and the role of citizens in the, in the open source, zero marginal cost, Jeremy Rifkin kind of a vision is going to be where the future is at. And I think that there's something that that's a product of the perspectival fossilized world of, of these very hardened dualities. And I think that hard and fast line between this is the private sector and my private business and enterprise and get the hell, get your government, you know, tentacles out of my system. It, it, that's going to, that's going to start to break down. And that's why I'm so excited about, you know, uh, Bowens and the P2P stuff. And um, it, it is, it is really a place where we can, we can meet in the middle and mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anyway, I'm rambling, but. No, that's great. Um, my, my last thing I want to mention too is, um, you know, what Richard Wolff talks about um, when he's uh, discussing like uh, worker owned cooperatives and he names a couple of examples in Spain. And um, I think that's another example of this kind of making more fluid the the private and the public, right? What happens when we democratize the private, the private space, right? It's not that big government stepping in. It's actually that everybody's stepping in. So, yeah, I think these hybridizations are the kind of things we're going to be seeing more and more of and need to get more comfortable with because it's only a problem if we continue to, to like separate it private versus public and what belongs where. And um, we're not moving into that. Like, that's not the, the, the dynamic anymore. That's just not the reality anymore. That's not what we're growing down into. So I'm just affirming what you said, Ryan, in terms of, in terms of uh, superseding that dualism and moving into a stranger space where the public is private and the private is public. Yeah, and, and my argument to that would be, I mean, you just had this 
sort of stimulus package where if the markets were act, you know, sort of the free markets and stay out of my, you know, have the Fed stay out of the, the private sector, then don't take money from the public sector. Have them tr have businesses truly fail if they go bankrupt. And, and again, I know this is, would start a whole new kind of conversation, but I think it's definitely worth hovering around this sort of discussion between private and public, anti-government, um, kind of moving forward and, and just to see kind of what comes out of it. Mm. I think this is a good space to close out. We've got about 90 minutes. So um, any, any closing thoughts, guys, before our next episode? I, I oh go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. No, go ahead. I was say yeah. This was this was fun. Um, I've I've been kind of wanting to do one of these for a while, just so that we can really get our thoughts out there. And if we lose Jeremy, he's frozen on my screen. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yours frozen on my screen, but um, yeah. Like I think we also have a lot to say about these things too. <laughs> it's it's nice to be able to process our, our thinking out loud here. So. Uh, to the audience. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks. And we'll see you for the next one. Maybe we'll do one more, uh, one more integration episode before we jump on with a, if, with another guest. So, great.